begin. I'm going to begin by praying. I'm also going to light the Hanukkah. Doesn't look very uh, straight, but we'll light it. And we'll pray. Not a very healthy looking Hanukkah for sure. Okay, now I don't do, I used to want to do and do a traditional Hanukkah blessing, but I don't anymore because Jesus taught us to pray spontaneously. And I try to avoid too many uh, repetitious traditional prayer. So, the Hanukkah represents, of course, on many levels, the light that God has brought into this world. And Jesus said clearly that he was the light of this world. John chapter 8. John chapter 1, John says that in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and everything was created. But then, the Word was the light that shone, that shone in all men, the light of God. So the light of God is Messiah Yeshua. And we also have the opportunity to be light as we become reflectors of him, his attributes, and not just his attributes, of course, the light that shines in him, the hope of the kingdom of God to be established in the earth. And that's our hope. Our hope is in nothing else but the kingdom of God. We've come to the end of having hope in this kingdom, and having hope in God's kingdom only is our only hope. So... Father God, we thank you, Lord, for the hope of your kingdom. We thank you, Lord, for your son, Yeshua, the anointed one. He is the anointing that you have provided that we might have light. He is the oil in the heavenly menorah. And God, we bless you. We praise you. We thank you, Lord, that we even know to light this Hanukkah, symbolic of your heavenly menorah. And God, we praise you and your son Yeshua. We thank you, Lord, that you are gracious to us and that your light does shine through him in us. Let our light shine that we may glorify you, O Lord. Let our works, our good works, be a reflection of your light and your goodness and your mercy. And God, we praise you and we bless you, Lord. Amen. Amen. That will provide a little warmth <laughs> for us. <laughs> not, what, uh, not what some of us want. All right, so let's begin. I hope I have a good, yeah, I do. I have a good marker tonight. Didn't actually clean the board the way I wanted to. I'm falling behind on everything. I used to have the boards all wiped down every day and the tables. I'm falling behind. It's an amazing thing. So tonight we begin the long-awaited study of the book of Revelation. And the marker isn't the best. Isn't that something? All right, we'll, we'll do with it. All right, so the book of Revelation, this, we're going to call this class one. I've gone outside of the class material, and uh, not really, you can, you can follow the material in the course, but I'm going beyond what's in the course at this point. So I have a Hebrew phrase for us. Can try and spell spell that word for us. It's malchet, malchet, malchet is kingdom. Melech is king. Malchet, malchet is kingdom. 
This is another Hebrew word that we use quite often. All right. Yes. Make sure I get the vowels right here. Yep. Malchet Kohanim. And it is in English Kingdom of Priests. We're going to see that tonight, represented in the book of Revelation, that we are a kingdom and priest. In one place, Revelation chapter 1 and Revelation chapter 5, we are called a kingdom and priest again, or a kingdom of priests. And also in Revelation chapter 20, we'll see it again. Uh, the, 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 those in the first resurrection will become priests of our God and of his Messiah. So, Malchet um, Kohanim. How would I translate or read that? Do I need to anyway? Let's see. I have it here as Malchet Kohanim. Spells a little bit, transliteration is a little different. Anyway, it means kingdom of priests. All right, so let's talk about the book of Revelation. What are some of the things that we've been told about the book of Revelation? No one can understand it. It's not, right, it's not to be understood. You have to be either anointed as a prophet type or well studied, well versed to understand the book of Revelation that scholars themselves have have, uh, have, have poured over the book of Revelation for hundreds of years and they don't understand it, so we shouldn't even try to uh, gain any understanding of the book of Revelation. And then you have others who will teach the book of Revelation from certain viewpoints. And what we will see as we study is that there are four viewpoints of interpretation for the book of Revelation, and we'll talk about that as we go along four completely different systems or viewpoints in regards to interpretation and understanding of the book of Revelation. Just to give you a pointer, we here at the Institute, we apply the historic view, historic application to understanding and interpreting the book of Revelation. There are many different views. And so we'll discuss that at length as we go on. So the book of Revelation now is actually a revelation that was given to Jesus. This is post-incarnated, post-resurrection, post-ascended Jesus, who is at the right hand of God, was given a revelation, an insight from God. God is the only source of revelation, insight. So the Father God had, give, had given Jesus, who's at the right hand of God at that point, a, a, a revelation that he in turn gave to John, and John in turn gave that revelation to us. So this is actually Jesus' revelation that was given to him, again given to him by God. Let's look at that as we, as we begin. Revelation chapter 1. The hope for tonight is that we would read and, and, and talk through and study Revelation 1 to 3. That's, that's a hope and I think we can do it. So Revelation chapter 1. The revelation of Jesus the Messiah which God gave to him to show to his bond servants. So God gave this revelation to Jesus. For what purpose? To show to us. To show us. To, to, in, to give us insight. To teach us. To show us. The things which must soon take place. And he sent and, and communicated it by his angel to his born servant John. So an angel, a messenger of Jesus. And that messenger becomes more intriguing as the book goes along further and further. By the time we get to Revelation chapter 19, the messenger, the angel, becomes a bit of an enigma. When we study through the book of Revelation, we must keep in mind that an angel is a messenger. And that's certainly John's point of view in the book of Revelation. Angels are mentioned again several times in the book of Revelation who are messengers, simple messengers, and sometimes they are angelic beings, what we think of angelic beings. In Revelation chapter 12, the angels are 
referred to as stars. You know, the dragon swept away a third of the stars of heaven with his tail. Those are angels. So you have a, you have a few references in the book of Revelation to, to what we call angels. What we're going to see tonight is that in Revelation 2 and 3, the angels are not angelic beings. They are messengers. Primarily, they are the messengers to the seven churches in Asia Minor. So they are, they are probably preachers, pastors, or evangelists who are given messages by Jesus to give to the seven churches. So keep that in mind about what a messenger is or an angel. Because the word angel, uh, Malak, is actually messenger, one who brings a message. So here in Revelation chapter 1, verse 1, his angel, his messenger, is to give this message to John. Now, in Revelation chapter 19, we're going to see that this messenger made a statement, and the statement was, I am a fellow bond servant like you. That says that he's not necessarily an angelic being like Uriel, Raphael, you know, Gabriel, Michael, and so on. He, was, he, see, he identified himself as a fellow born servant and one who had the testimony of Jesus. That's complicated, and I'm to this day not able to understand that or to go beyond the fact that that's what it says. So the messenger here is probably human. I don't get it, but that's what we're seeing. At any rate, this is Jesus' revelation. And what does that tell us? It tells us that he received this from God. It was something that he didn't always have. At a certain point, God gave him this insight. Tells us a little bit about the nature of Jesus relative to the nature of God, even after the ascension. Because this happened after the ascension, right? Tells us a little something about Jesus, that he's not, what? All-knowing. If he was all-knowing, there would be no need for God to give him a revelation. God gave him this revelation, and the purpose of the revelation was for his benefit, of course, but also that we may receive the revelation. So based on that, what do you think about the scholars and the people who say that we don't need to try and understand the book of Revelation? All right? Not, not a good argument, because he gave us the book of Revelation so that we can understand it. Uh, we can receive it and understand it. And so I am convinced that we have every right to believe that we can and should fully understand the book of Revelation. In fact, when, when we're done with this part of the course, the book of Revelation in general, we will see clearly that the book of Revelation is very understandable. All right, so now the book of Revelation now can be divided principally into three, three sections or three categories. And I'll put the three categories up on the board for us. Before we do, someone read for us, nice and loudly, Revelation chapter 1, verse 19. My readers are failing me. It means that my eyes are getting worse, and they are. It's a shame. I have to strengthen my readers. So someone, if you would, read Revelation chapter 1, verse 19. So the things which he had seen, the things which are, and the things which will take place. You can take the entire book of Revelation and divide it into those three, I call them categories or three, three dimensions. One, things which he had seen. That's referring to what? The past. And what were the things that he had seen? A revelation of Jesus, an appearance of Jesus in power. That's, from, that's the past at this point. Things which you have seen. Secondly, the things which are to come. No, excuse me, the things which are. Excuse me. The things which are.
This relates to Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2 and 3. The things which existed at that time that were relative to the church, the, the, the churches in Asia Minor, that he would address in the next chapter. And then the third category of the book of Revelation, of course, is the largest, largest aspect or category of the book of Revelation, which is the things to come. That's based on that one verse that we just read, we just read, excuse me, in Revelation chapter 1, verse 19. Someone read that again for us? Revelation 1, verse 19. Read it again for us. Please. Which things which you have seen, past, things which are, present, and the things which shall take place after these things. So, future. So, we're going to read tonight Revelation chapter 2 and 3, which represents the things which are things that are happening right at that time. We're going to see relative to the things that he saw, which really only amounts to a stark revelation of Jesus. A rep, uh, he had what's referred to as a Christophacy, a vision, an appearance of Jesus, came to him in, in glory, and that's what he had seen. And he reports that. <laughs> so it's important for us to even see and to understand that John had a Christophacy, a revelation of Jesus. Many of us have had what we call Christophases. Not quite as profound and impactful as what John had. Because what John had and what he saw is pretty intense. We'll read it here in a few moments. I had a Christophacy one Wednesday night prayer and fast meeting. I was sitting right about where that chair is next to Lisa. And I had a good old fashioned Christophacy. I had a vision of Jesus. He appeared in a vision as I stood there and prayed. I checked out of this realm and suddenly I was in another place seeing something that, that my mind was allowing me to see that God had generated in my mind. It was a clear-cut, concise vision where I was taken up in what I can only describe as sort of a, 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 a ferris wheel, not a ferris wheel, sort of like riding a, a roller coaster, you're just being taken up. But instead of a roller coaster, it was clouds. I saw literal clouds. I, I found myself being taken up, and at the zenith, at the top of this ascent, he was standing before me. And he was not in the glory that we're going to see here, but he was a glorious being. And he stood before me, and he smiled, and where I was, he, in my vision, I felt that he was standing right where I'm at right now. He smiled and he opened his arms and he went, he went on to rebuke me. And the rebuke was simple. He said to me in the vision, and I heard it, you must love and show compassion. At that time, I was, uh, I was a crusader for Jesus. I was yielding the sword. I was going after Roman Catholics. I was cutting down uh, the, the, the best of them. I was proven that the system was evil, and it was, and the proof is pretty, pretty simple to, get, to arrive at, but the rebuke was simple. You know all these things. You see, and, and when he speaks two or three words, he speaks volumes. Let me just say that. When you, when you genuinely hear from Jesus, one or two words can, can just echo volumes in your head, and he said to me, you're, you're doing all of this for naught. You're only, you're only developing hate and anger and bitterness in you. Uh, and the word was, you must love and show compassion to the people that I was hounding. I was hounding family members and telling them how evil their, their religion was and how much they need to not be a part of that system and so on. I had all the evidence. I had all the proof. And he brought me down to it. Now, he could have, he could have done that in a different way, but he brought me to himself. He extended himself. He was before me. I know what he looks like. And he's nothing like the frail, dying person on the crucifix. Nothing like that at all. He had a, a, a good head of hair. He had a band around his forehead. And his hair was thick. The band pressed into his, to his, uh, to his quaff. 
He had a, he had a beard, a white beard, and his eyes were the best. The best way I can describe his eyes were, is that his eyes were timeless, ageless. I saw his eyes. His eyes were ageless. His face was ageless. Didn't 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 reflect any any uh, any specific age. But it was I had, the only thing I can say it was ageless, timeless is what I sensed when I looked at his face. And again, he smiled and he said, you must love and show compassion. And the rebuke was soundly resonated in me and I, I received it. After about two days, I came to terms with the fact that what I was actually doing was not trying to save anyone, but I was actually showing hatred and animosity towards the system and therefore the people as well. So since then, I've learned to, to address the system and not the people. And he hasn't come back to rebuke me since. And so I have the affirmation that rebuking or, or going after the system is what he wants and not going after the people. But I had a Christophacy, but nothing like this. Nothing like this. That was a personal thing between me and him. But this is different. John is given this Christophacy, and it's a glorious one for us to see and to recognize the glory that's in Christ, the glory of Messiah. He appeared to me uh, nothing glorious. He had a white gong on. He had a good strap, uh, what was a belt around his waist, uh, sort of a cord actually. And I've often wondered if it was a golden cord, and I, I didn't look at the cord, I looked at his face, and he stretched out his arms like this, that's what I saw. It was a welcoming gesture. Welcoming gesture, a smile, and a word. But here, we're going to see powerful, powerful symbols of God's glory in him and his power and so on. So let's read about what John had seen. So we read John, uh, Revelation chapter 1, verse 1. Let's, I'm going to read 2 and 3, and someone else, if you would, if you can, uh, someone pick it up, if you can, in, uh, John, in Revelation chapter 1. Read 4 to 9 for us, and we'll go on from 10 to, to 18. So Revelation chapter 1, I'm going to read 1 again, 1 to 3. The revelation we read this just now, I'm reading it again. The revelation of Messiah Jesus, which God gave him to show to his bond servants the things which must soon take place, and he sent and communicated by his angel to his bond servant, John, who testified to the word of God and to the testimony of Messiah Yeshua, even to all that he saw. Blessed is, the, blessed is he who has who reads and those who hear the words of the prophecy and heed the things which are written in it for the time is near. All right, the time has been near from the, from the standpoint of this revelation for 1,800 years, 1,900 years. But the time is always near, isn't it? Because when you really stop and think about the coming of Christ, the coming of Christ is only, only as far away as the life of the believer and the time when that believer's life will come to an end. And what I mean by that is, from John's place in time, John was possibly about 90 years old when he received this. The coming of Christ was possibly 10 years away. For John, the time is near. So the time is near for every believer. No matter how old you are, the time is always near. When does he actually appear over the eastern sky? Well, that's a different story. But we know that the moment we die, we are with him, and we are appearing with him at that very moment, whenever we die. So space and time is, is folded, it's lapsed, and we're with him as soon as he comes. That's in space and time, not Earth's space and time, but God's space and time. All right, so now we're going to read someone, if you would please read Revelation chapter 4. One, two, nine. So this is where we're going to begin to see the aspects of Messiah and subsequent verses, actually. Actually, it's going to be 10 to uh, 18. But let's read someone. Read 4 to, uh, to, to verse 9. We're going to get some insight here about, about the church and about God the Father and his relationship to Jesus to some extent. So someone read that for us, verse 4 to 9. Thank you. 
Now, my Bible says he has made us a kingdom priest to our God. Some Bible says, some, some translations will say, he has made us to be a kingdom of priests. The Greek is closer to that. If you have a Bible that says that, the Greek is actually closer to that Bible that says a kingdom of priests. Anyway, go ahead. Okay, that's verse 9. John, both your brothers and companion in tribulation and kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ was on the island and called, called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. Okay. Important points there that was read that he has made us to become a kingdom and priests or a kingdom of priests. That concept is clearly represented in 1 Peter chapter 2, isn't it? We read this a few times. Very, very clear and concise. Peter makes two references of that in 1 Peter chapter 2, and we'll see two more references in the book of Revelation about us being a priesthood. And so that's an important, that's an important uh, revelation, right? But you don't hear much about that in conventional Christianity. And any, anyone, anyone knows why in Protestant conventional Christianity, you don't have a lot of people teaching that the church is a priesthood. You have some. You have some, but it's not something that's really put a lot, uh, given a lot of emphasis. Uh, Derek Prince, back in the 19, early 1990s, uh, taught a series of teachings on the church as a priesthood. But he was a Bible teacher, and if the Bible says it, he'll teach it. And there were many others like him as well. So why do you think there is not enough emphasis on the church being a priesthood? I think a couple of reasons. One, they don't quite understand it. Two, it's for in the Protestant church, it's related to the Episcopalians and the Catholics and the and the Orthodox churches, and we don't want to identify with the Orthodox churches in the Protestant movement. So when you say priesthood, you're pointing to the Orthodox church, and that, from a, from a limited point of view, validates the Orthodox church, so we don't want to deal with that, right? So both, both, both concepts are completely wrong. Uh, the priesthood is not a select group within the church. The church is the priesthood. So every believer in Christ has a function as a priest. The, the point is, are we functioning that way? Have we embraced our priesthood? That's the, real, that's the real essence of the question. Not that the priesthood is a select group. <laughs> no, not at all. Or that a priesthood is somehow forbidden, korban. No, we are a priesthood. That's important. Now, John also refers to, in this first part of the book of Revelation that we read thus far, that, uh, that, that there are people that are going through persecution, um, and he was exiled on the island of Patmos when he had this, this, this vision. Um, now, he mentions about the seven churches, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamon, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea, which is what we're going to look at tonight, Revelation 2 and 3. The message was given to Yeshua, given to his angel. Now, that's, it's an interesting reference there. Communicated in verse 1 of chapter 1, communicated it by his, Yeshua's, angel. <laughs> his angel uh, to his bond servants, bond servant John, and to us. So, we're going to read about the seven churches. Now, this letter is addressed to the seven churches, 
But, of course, we know it's also addressed to us, right? One of the things that we have to avoid, and, and we see this all the time in, Bible, in standard Bible prophecy teaching, is to take the seven churches of Asia Minor and apply them to all the churches around the world. In other words, you take all of the churches around the world and you can divide them into seven categories. There is no reason to do such a thing. These are seven churches that had their own unique set of issues and their values and their strengths that he had to address. It's not, he's not addressing Fellowship Church here or any other church. But at the same time, the messages that we see here to the seven churches in Asia Minor are, are, are essential for us to consider. But, you know, there's no church today of Laodicea. There's no church today of, of Ephesus. That's just bad concepts. That, that, that's really problematic. Really problematic, actually. So, so let's move on. All right, so now we're going we're gonna to read verses 10 to 18. Someone, if you can, if you would like, read that for us. And we're going to see, relative to the revelation that he had, that relates to what John had seen. So, someone please, with a loud, clear voice. for a moment. So this is John's vision of Yeshua. Note he said that he saw someone like the Son of Man. Someone that resembles the Son of Man that Jesus, he knew, but he's not exactly like him. He's different. And what's, what's different about Yeshua here? He's glorified. Of course, this is Yeshua, and that's proven throughout the book of Revelation that the person who he interacted with, interacted with was Yeshua. But the point is, he was seeing Yeshua from a different, from a from an unfamiliar vantage, seeing him as a glorified uh, being, and and his eyes are a flame of fire. He never saw Yeshua in that light. Why would his eyes be a flame of fire? Huh? Right. Because this is about pressing the fierce wrath of God the Almighty. That's how the book ends, right? Revelation chapter 19. So the revelation brings to light the reality that Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah. That's where we find that phrase for the first and only time. And he's going to bring God's judgment. So, so far he's seen something that's, he, that's, that's, that has challenged him. Someone like the Son of Man, but it is the Son of Man. Just a different picture of the Son of Man. He's glorified. So then now read 15 to 18 for us. That's Yeshua, right? There's, there's no mistake in it. That's Jesus. And initially, John didn't recognize him. One like the Son of Man, but it, it was proven to be him. What, did, what happened to John when he realized who he was interacting with? He fell on his face as if he, if he had died. The same thing happened to Daniel. The same thing happened to Ezekiel. The awesome being of God, the awesome presence of God will confront the soulish man and, and in many cases bring him to his knees. And I've had that experience 
Not quite to that extent. Seems like I've had these types of experiences, but never to this, never quite to this extent. <laughs> Which is good. I'm not looking for anything like this. I don't need the extra harassment. But it's it's uh, it's powerful when you have that visitation. It will it will grab you to the core of your being. I remembered when I had that. Christophacy, which was nothing like this. I did see the white here. I did see the woolly, woolly here. I did see the, the eyes, but it wasn't fiery. I did, see the, I did see the aspects of what John saw, but nothing like this. And I was standing there, and this thing happened like, it just came out of nowhere. Like a dream, but it wasn't a dream. You know, a dream just pops into your head, it unfolds. And a dream takes seconds, but in the dream it feels like it's been going on for two hours, right? But dreams are seconds in duration, right? Sometimes nanoseconds, boom. You have a thought, and that thought elevates or expands in your mind. It's a dream. Well, I stood there, and I found myself being pulled up, and I'm there, and, and, and this thing happened, and then it just disappeared, and I opened my eyes. And I was in a daze. I, I stood there, and I looked around at people. John Klein was here, and uh, David Pavlik stood right there next to me, and I looked at them, and I wondered to myself in that state, did they see that? And I looked at them, and, and John smiled at me, and I plopped right down on the chair. Blop! And I was just exhausted and rebuked, quite frankly. I was exhausted and rebuked. And uh, at the end of the meeting, I staggered out of here. It took me two days to, to understand and receive fully what had happened. It's a profound, profound event. It gripped me. And John here, he's, it, his, his experience is so intense. Now, John had personal relationship with Jesus as the Son of Man. But this vision and this representation of Yeshua was so powerful that he just passed out completely. He just passed right out. <laughs> I can understand that. I can understand how that can happen. But Jesus said some pretty profound things. He said, he said that he was the first and the last. Right? Is that what he said? The first and the last. And the living one, the one within there is life. And I was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. And I have the keys of death and Hades. What does that mean? He has the power to put to death and the power to put into Hades, which is Hades is what we call hell. I'm going to read 19 and 20. We already read 19. I'll read 19 and 20. Therefore, write the things which, which you have seen, the things which are, the things which will take place after these things. As for the mystery of the seven stars, which you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the, are, the, are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. So, that's an important verse that has to be defined. The seven angels are the seven ministers, pastors, preachers of the seven churches. The seven golden candle stands or, or, or lamp stands, which are menorahs, they're menorahs. The seven menorahs that he saw are the, the seven anointed bodies of believers. The, the candle stand, that's a Hanukkah, that's not a menorah. But you know, I saw a wonderful Hanu uh, Hanukkah in Israel, one that I would like to get, and I'm going to, if the church can afford it, these are hard times, but if the church can afford it, I'm going to try and get one. The most fabulous Hanukkah I've ever seen, it's, uh, I'll, I can draw it, yeah, I can draw it, I can draw, right? It's, it's a most wonderful Hanukkah. All right? What's that? That's a menorah. That's not a Hanukkah. Why is it not a Hanukkah? Seven. But what I saw, and this was in the Knesset. This is the, the Hanukkah that they light in the Knesset. What I saw is an olive branch. So the other two branches were olive branches. In this Hanukkah that I saw, that's in Knesset. What's the significance of this? Anyone? Zechariah chapter 4. 
right? What did Zachariah see? He saw a menorah, what was clearly a menorah, and on either side of the menorah, he see olive branches, and the anointing was not the oil, the olive oil that keeps the menorah lit, was not coming from the, from the olive trees or the olive branches, it was coming from the menorah in Zachariah's vision. That there were seven pipes that were flowing and providing the anointing oil for the olive branches or the olive trees. That's why I want this Hanukkah. I'm going to try and find one. Might be impossible, but I know Danny Boy. Who knows who Danny Boy is? I know Danny Boy in Jerusalem, and if anybody can get it, Danny Boy is going to get it. And believe me, Danny Boy is shut down. He has no business. And if, he's, if, he, if I call him to find that, he will get right on it. <laughs> so I'm going to try and get that for ourselves. So, so Jesus is the menorah. I mean, we've been over this many, many times. He is the light of the world. In the tabernacle, when you walk into the tabernacle, what keeps the tabernacle alit? The menorah. Remember, the tabernacle was made with burnished gold glistening gold and so a match in a room uh, laid over with glistening gold will just ignite the whole room right well the menorah provided light for the whole dwelling place of god and he is the menorah jesus is the menorah the, more, but the menorah represents his ministry why would i say his ministry it represents him his ministry because he's the light of the world but that light is to reflect through the church that's the ministry aspect so he is the menorah. Here, the seven churches has seven menorahs associated with them. That's important for us to keep in mind. So every church that's anointed, who's anointing the churches? The menorah, the light. Now, what did Zechariah say concerning the menorah? He was the, the Lord of the whole earth. That's what Zechariah said about the menorah. Either side of the Lord of the whole earth are the servants who are standing alongside him. So John, and we will see this in a, few, in a couple of weeks, in Revelation chapter 11, said the same thing. He saw the same vision and that the Lord of the whole earth was in fact the menorah. So if you want, a, if you want an appropriate symbol for who Jesus is, the menorah. That's, that's it. Perfect. So, but... He's going to address the seven churches concerning the light that's in them, the menorah that's been placed in the midst of them. The menorah, the Lord of the whole earth, is the source of the anointing. And that anointing is represented by light. Light in the midst of the churches. So, now with that, let's move on to the things which, according to what John saw, the things which are or existed at that present time. Yes? In Revelation. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, I don't quite know exactly the connection between the eyes and the spirits, but we can, we can deduce that the seven eyes are, are the means by which God is looking out into, into creation. Who has been given charge over creation? Yeshua, the Lord of the whole earth. That's why he's the Lord of the whole earth. He's been given charge of all creation. Uh, Paul said that all power and authority has been given unto him in heaven and on earth. So the things concerning earth is given unto him. So that's one way of looking at it. The seven spirits are probably referring to the, to, the, to the churches. You know, God has provided the Ruach Kodesh, the Holy Spirit, His Holy Spirit. But there's also the Spirit of Christ, the Spirit of Messiah, that Paul referred to. The Spirit of Messiah is different from the Holy Spirit because the Spirit of Messiah has to do with the attributes of Messiah. Unity, love togetherness, oneness, prophecy. Those are attributes of the Spirit of Messiah. 
later on when we study in the book of Ephesians and Romans and Corinthians, we will see Paul making reference to the spirit of Messiah or the mystery of Messiah, which has to do with who he is. So these seven churches were manifesting the spirit of Messiah, providing that the attributes of Christ were in them. So every church has the Spirit of Christ, hopefully. And that's not necessarily the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is an active part of that, of course. But the Spirit of Christ is, for instance, when we come together to worship, and this happened much more so when we were able to make physical contact, to hold hands and embrace each other and so on, there were many, many times that a very distinct and unique and separate Spirit from the Holy Spirit will appear. And which is the Spirit of Christ. Unity, love, brotherhood, oneness. That's the Spirit of Christ. And it becomes, it becomes really obvious in the midst of us. Right? And so that's the Spirit that I think is being referred to. The seven spirits, they're actually seven churches manifest in the Spirit of Christ. Paul referred to it as a mystery. That's perhaps all we need to know. It's a mystery. But it's not a mystery that cannot be deciphered. It's not a mystery that's too far off for us to understand. It's simply referring to the light that's in us, the attributes of Christ, right? Okay. So I'm, I'm going to read perhaps uh, most of Revelation chapter 2 and 3, simply because we need to move through these fairly quickly. So what's the point of reading now the things which were, the things that existed at that time. What's the point of reading about the seven churches and the way Jesus related to the seven churches? It's important for us because here we're going to, we're going to catch a glimpse, in fact, not catch a glimpse, we're going to see very clearly the mind of Yeshua on a level that, that, that doesn't always appear in the Bible. Now, we're going, to, we're going to read about his opinion and the way he relates to these seven churches. And we're going to recognize him from the Gospels. But what the Jesus we're going to see here is not the Jesus that's currently sitting in, sitting in mangers around the world. He's a different Jesus than what most of what Christianity has devised. And you'll see why as we read through here. So this is Jesus now, Yeshua, speaking to the seven churches in Asia Minor. How many churches existed at this time? Maybe, maybe 500. Maybe, maybe less. There were churches at this time throughout Judea, Samaria, northern Africa, Egypt, Babylon, but these are in Asia Minor only, a very small area, relatively speaking. Seven churches that were in this area right here. There were churches all here, here, all the way over here at this time, all the way even into Europe. He's only speaking to seven churches in this, short, this very small area right here. And so let's read. To the angel or the messenger of the church of Ephesus write, the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand and the one who walks among the seven golden lampstands or menorahs says this, I know your deeds and your toil and your perseverance and that you cannot tolerate evil men and you put to, and you put to test those who call themselves apostles and they are not. You found them to be false. And you have perseverance and you have, you, and you have endured for my name's sake and have not grown weary. But I have this against you. What? Jesus has something against the church. I, has this, I have this against you that you have left your first love. Therefore remember from where you have fallen and repent and do the deeds you did at first. Or else, the ramifications or else I am coming to you and will remove your menorah out of its place unless you repent. Jesus is adamant here. They left their first love, church at Ephesus. And if they don't repent of this, even though they have some good attributes, right? They're doing some good things. You can't stand evil people. You test them to see if they're from God or not. Who established the church at Ephesus? Paul was the apostle, right? Paul laid hands on the ten believers who lived near to the, next to the synagogue in Ephesus and they received the baptism of the Holy Spirit and that was the beginning of the church. Now this is 15 years later. 
the church had grown, the church had gone a little further away from its, from its nucleus. And when you read the, the, the book of Ephesus, Paul, right into the church at, at, at Ephesus, he gave strong commendations to the church. He, he, in other words, he gave approval. He gave approval to what they were doing. And what we see in this letter is that the love of the brethren, love of each other, unity and oneness, was pretty prevalent in this church compared to the church at Rome. He gives no such commendation at the church at Rome. He gives no such commendation to the church at, at uh, Laodice, uh, 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 Corinthians. Uh, the, the church at, at Colossae was a pretty together church, but not the commendations about the love and the unity and the love of the brethren, the agape love. This is mentioned in the book of Ephesus concerning that church. It's complimentary. This was at the beginning of the existence of that church. I, I say to you that at some point in its development, 15, 20 years later, they began to wane away from that agape love, the love of, the love of God for each other. It's agape love, but it's also filial, right? But it's agape love extended to each other, the love of the brethren and the service to each other. Paul had to rebuke the church at Rome because that was lacking. But what, what existed in, in, in the church at Ephesus was just that. I want to submit to you that their first love that Jesus is referring to is that very same thing. The first love that they had for the brethren, for each other. The love that they shared, the agape love that they shared among themselves. And that they had began to lose it. And Jesus is calling them back to it. Why? Because without it, you don't have a church. Without unity, you don't have the spirit of Messiah. You just don't have, you don't have the light in the midst of you, the menorah, the anointing. There is a connection between oneness, unity, love, the spirit of Christ, and the menorah, the light. It's literally the anointing that keeps the light shining. And so he's warning them, if you, if you don't return to this love, this agape love for each other, I'm going to remove your menorah. Now what does that mean in a practical sense? that the anointing is gone. That's a scary thing, right? That a church can lose its anointing. So ponder that for a moment. A church can lose its menorah. Without that unity, without that spirit of Christ, without love, compassion, uh, determination for, for oneness, the love of the brethren, those things can cause a church to lose its anointing. So how many times, and there's one person here who's not a part of the church, but how many times from the pulpit and from up front you would hear an exhortation concerning love, unity, you know, putting away of, of differences and, and yielding to the oneness factor, the, the echad, many, many times, and that's, this is why. Because without that, we don't have the anointing, right? And so let's read on. Yes. All right. So yeah, the, the, and, and if listen, you don't even have to read that to really see what Jesus is pointing to. Read John chapter fifteen. Read John chapter fifteen. I mean, we'll do it another time. We don't have time tonight, but it's very much related to this point. I preached this one time from the pulpit. I had the time then, two hours, and so I brought John chapter fifteen into this factor. I am divine, you are the branches. If you abide in me, and I will abide in you, you know it. But then later on in the chapter, he begins to identify what it is to abide in him. He says it quite clearly, abide in my love. And he says it, real, he identifies it, what it is to abide in him. 
And you put that together, it makes too much sense to ignore. He in the midst of us. He, if he's divine, we're divine. He's the brand, we are the branches, he's divine. Abide in him, abide in this love, and the menorah will stay lit in the midst of us. If we don't abide in him, what happens? The father comes along, the vine dresser, and he removes the menorah. It's, it's just, like I said, it makes too much sense to ignore. All right, so that love and unity and oneness factor was strong in the early Ephesus church, but perhaps it began to dwindle to the point where Jesus had to come along and say, hey, you're doing good things, but if this doesn't change, you're going to lose your anointing. Verse 6, Yet this you do have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Jesus hates the deeds of the Nicolaitans. He, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. So here is the reward for the one who overcomes. Overcomes what? To the, to the one who overcomes what? The, the loss of the community. That's specific, but in general, the one who overcomes the tendency to fall away, the one who overcomes and isn't drawn into Jesus, doesn't abide in him. Right? The one who overcomes and turns to unrighteousness and sin. This one who does, who does overcome will eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Overcomes also the deeds of the Nicolaitans. And we'll see the Nicolaitans again. Who are the Nicolaitans? The Nicolaitan, the word Nicolaitan is a composite word. It is not a person or even a group of people necessarily. And I, I did all the research and the scholars are all perplexed. Who were the Nicolaitans? Do a Google search. Who were the Nicolaitans? Honest scholars will say, we don't know. They were a church movement, is what they would say. And they're right. The Nicolaitans were not followers of Nicholas, as some people like to proclaim. There wasn't even a Nicholas at that time. The word Nico in Greek means to conquer or to ascend. Ascend. Ascend above something. Ascend. Conquer. To rise above. Nico. Laetans is where we get the word. Think about it. Laetan. Laity. So Nicolaitan is actually a phrase. It's a composite word. Those who would rise above the laity. Now, Jesus had some important things to say about this, didn't he? If anyone seeks to be great, he must become a servant, the servant of all. All right. Jesus wasn't partial to clergy or clergyism. He never appointed clergyism, the concept of a clergy. That was not his doing. That came along some time after the church. He said to Peter, and I believe Peter was appointed to be the pastor of the early church, something else happened, and a clergy took over, namely the brother of Jesus, the natural brother of Jesus. But Peter was appointed by Jesus to feed his sheep, to be the pastor of that early church. And Jesus had an appointment with Peter where he would call Peter to become the pastor. What was Peter doing? He was fishing. He had given up on Jesus. Remember? He had, he had turned his back on Jesus, denied him three times, found himself fishing in the Galilee. In fact, what we see there at the end of, book of, at the, end of the, uh, the, the book of uh, Luke, I believe it is, Peter says, you know what? I'm going fishing. Who's going with me? Suddenly he's in the Galilee. And then Jesus appears to him and provides for him. You know, Jesus said to him, you'll become a fisher of men. That Jesus met him on the Galilee and said to him, Peter, do you love me? Three times. Remember that Peter denied him three times, right? So three times Peter had to say, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Feed my sheep. So Peter was the shepherd. He was the appointed pastor of the early church. Again, something else happened. 
and we have a clergy in place. A clergy. A man appointed leader of the church. Again, his brother James. So, so the point is, the whole, the whole concept of clergyism, Nicolaitanism, began very early in the church. Men began to, arise, to rise above other men. That's the whole thing of clergyism, Nicolaitanism. Peter was the shepherd. Feed my sheep, serve my sheep. If anyone wants to be great, let him become servant of all. The least will be, the greatest will be the least. The first will be the last. And that's what Peter was called for. Jesus hates the deed of the Nicolaitans, those who will arise or, or, or ascend above the flock. It's really simple. It's not, it's not complex, right? It's pretty straightforward. Um, that's why, that's why as, a, as a, a shepherd, a under-shepherd, a pastor, um, standing in the same office that Peter was called to, I am a servant. And I do things like a servant. I function like a servant. I bring myself down low. I do the things that, that uh, most pastors won't do. I change people's toilets. I, I change toilets here. I, 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 I do dirty work. I do the hard work because I'm a servant. I'm not a Nicolaitan. I don't rise above the flock. And so Jesus makes a very clear statement here to the church at Ephesus. I hate the deeds, the strong words, I hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans. What were the deeds of the Nicolaitans? They were rising above the common laity. Now question, does that exist in the church at large? What do you think? Are there Nicolaitans in Christianity? Yes. Of course there is. Unfortunately, in just about every church that you can conceive of, there is that. Now, there are many shepherds out there, many genuine servants, who will humble themselves sufficiently to become, to become as Peter was, a servant to the flock. Yes, there are many. I'm not going to paint with such a broad brush. But by and large, what we see in regards to the church that's in the limelight is that pastors are elevated beings, elevated personas. You know, I, I've heard all the stories, incredible stories, about uh, some of the pastors who function in, in the churches out there and what, they, what, they, what they're capable of doing. It's, it's a horror story. They're not servants. Let me just say that way. They're not functioning as servants. And they need to repent and come back to being servants. If anybody seeks to be great, let them become servant of all. I, you know, <laughs> it's as if Jesus didn't say these things. It's as if he didn't make these incredible statements. And we go on to elevate ourselves above the flock and so on. It's terrible. Terrible, you know. It, it, it irks me because it's, it undermines the word of God when I see the, these kinds of things happening. But Jesus hates the deeds of the Nicolaitans, right? The word Nicolaitan, really a composite word. There's no such person as Nicholas. The followers of Nicholas, they don't, that doesn't exist anywhere. They were, they were clergies who ascended above the laity. All right, let's read about the church of Smyrna. To the angel, to the messenger of the church of Smyrna. Now note, he's not addressing the church. He's addressing the one who has the responsibility <laughs> for the church. You know, Jesus functioned like a military-minded person. Chain of command. Right? Chain of command. And he's going to the messenger of the church. Now what we will see with the church at Thyatira He's also going to address the messenger concerning the leaders in the church. He's going, to, he's going to hold that messenger responsible for what the elders, what the leaders in that church were doing. Very, very stark. And, you know, I, I, quite often I gauge my efforts in ministry based on some of what we're talking about tonight. I, 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 take, my, I take my orders from what we're reading here tonight. The first and the last... Who was dead and has come to life and says this, he says this, I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich. What a powerful statement. And the blasphemy of those who say, who, who say they are Jews and are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. So that statement there says a lot. It says that there are Jews who are of the synagogue of God. These Jews are of the synagogue of Satan. They say that they are Jews, but they are not. 
the inference is pretty clear. There are Jews who are of God. I mean, you, you, can't, you can't mix that in any other, any other concussion. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to cast some of you into prison so that you will be tested and you will have tribulation for 10 days. No one knows for sure if that's 10 literal days or 10 years. Be faithful until death and I will give you the crown of life. He's calling for them to be willing to become what? Martyrs. Martyrs. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes will not be hurt by the lake of fire. The second death is hell. The second death is the lake of fire. What can we say about the church of Smyrna? They were pretty together. They suffered persecution, but there was no, 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 no essence of anything that was wrong in them. There was nothing that was off kilter. He just encouraged them to be strong, to know that they were coming under attack, and to persevere even on to death, right? So what does, what does that tell us? Even though they were a church that were about to experience persecution, they were strong. Stronger than the church at Ephesus. And to the messenger, the angel, to the church at Pergamon, write, the one who has the sharp two-edged sword says this, I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, and you hold fast my name and did not deny my faith even in the days of Antipas, my witness, my faithful one who was killed among you where Satan dwells. We have to analyze verse 13. What is he, what's he talking about? Where Satan's throne is. Who's Antipas? Antipas was clearly uh, a believer who didn't love his life unto death. And he was, he's referred to as his faithful one, did not compromise, did not acquiesce to Satan. Now, what's the point here concerning Satan's throne where Satan dwells in Pergamon? You've heard me say it before, but who remembers what's the significance of Pergamon? The temple of Zeus? Not just the temple of Zeus, it's the temple of the Roman emperors. So when Rome succeeded the Grecian Empire, they rolled up on the mountain of Zeus, Pergamon, Olympus, and in, in another, another reference, the mountain of Olympus. They came up on it and this, they said, this is the mountain of Zeus, where Zeus was worshipped. We're going to make, a, we're going to build a temple here and it will become the temple of the emperors. Because the emperors were, they were gods, but they were emissaries of Zeus in their thinking. They, re, they stood in the office of Zeus. Now Zeus, according to Greek mythology, Zeus was the god of this world, the god who gave strength to man. So who do we think Zeus would, would, would actually be in our, in our, in our, in our mindset? Who, who would Zeus be, according to our reckoning, our understanding? The god of this world, the god who gives strength to man, would be Satan. I mean, that's pretty obvious, right? Zeus would be... Satan. And the emperor stood in that office. That's why the temple of the emperor worship was built there. In other words, every emperor of Rome had a bust of himself in that temple in Pergamon, temple of Zeus, on Mount Olympus, Pergamon, where he was sacrificed to and worshipped at Pergamon. Jesus refers to Pergamon as the seat of Satan, the throne of Satan. Pretty self-explanatory, right? Okay. But I have a few things against you because you have there some who hold to the teachings of Balaam and who kept teaching Balak, who kept teaching Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit acts of immorality. So you also have some who in the same way hold to the teachings of the Nicolaitans. Therefore repent, or else I am coming to you quickly and will make war against them with the sword of my mouth. So here is Yeshua, the one with the two-edged sword that comes from his mouth. What is the two-edged sword? The sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. And he's threatening. What is he threatening? He's calling the leader, the, 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 the pastor, 
the messenger to repent. If you don't repent, I'm going to deal with these followers of the Nicolaitans and these who are adhering to the teachings of Balaam that's in your midst. Now, a few weeks ago, I openly repented before the congregation because I am the angel of Fellowship Church in that sense. I am the messenger. I found myself in sin, leading the congregation in that way, and I repented. It was Yeshua that led me to that repentance. And I knew without any question that if I hadn't repent openly, it would have been something like this for us. It was obvious that we had become challenged. It was obvious that he was making a statement to us. Too obvious to ignore. And the thing that he led me to repent of, I repented. Since then, that particular curse is no longer with us. All right, so he's calling the angel of this church here in Pergamon to repent. Now, this is a strong church in Pergamon because they're, they're in that place where Satan's throne is and they're surviving. Antipas was there. He didn't, he didn't, uh, he didn't, he didn't acquiesce. No, that's the, that's, the, that's the church before Smyrna. So this church is here where, in Pergamon, where the worship of the emperor's pagan worship was prevalent. But he had some, there was the, the pastor, the, the angel there, had, had, had began to tolerate man who was teaching the doctrine of Balaam, the teachings of Balaam. What did Balaam do? He led the children of Israel to, as Jesus says, to eat things, sacrifice to idols, to worship idols, and to conduct acts of immorality. Here's the, here's the story. Balaam attempted to curse Israel, right? Three times and failed. Then the last thing we see in Numbers chapter 24 is that Balaam, he's frustrated, he never manages to curse Israel, and he takes off. He goes back to Mesopotamia. But suddenly in chapter 25, we have the matter of Baal Peor. And the whole matter of Baal Peor is where the children of Israel worshipped Baal. And to worship in that context, to worship a pagan god like Baal or Ashtoreth, you had to sleep with the prostitutes of that particular god, and you had to eat foods that were sacrificed to that particular god. Eat foods that were sacrificed to pagan gods. And this is exactly what was happening in this church at Pergamon. So some pagan worship had filtered into the church. Almost get the, you almost get the sense that there were, quote-unquote, places of ill repute. And there must have been hundreds of them in Pergamon. Because Pergamon dealt with, with travelers, pilgrims, that will come to Pergamon to worship Zeus or to worship the emperors. So there, there were many, many places of ill repute. These houses of ill repute were also what we call restaurants and inns, where you would spend a night or two and you'd have meals. In these restaurants, the foods that were offered up were sacrificed to pagan gods. And if you ate the food in the restaurants, in the houses of ill repute, the inns, you're actually eating foods that's sacrificed to idols. Jesus has a bit of an issue with that. We're going to see it again. So the teachers of, the ones who were teaching the doctrines of Balaam were causing people to eat foods that were offered up to idols and to engage in immoralities, such as what will happen in places of ill repute. So perhaps this was happening with some in the church that the bishop or the pastor, the, the, the messenger, had no clue of. And Jesus is bringing it to light. And he's saying, deal with this. This is happening. This is actually happening. And you're responsible for this. I'm bringing it to light. Do something about it. What's the outcome if, if he doesn't? He's going to appear and he's going to slay these people, these men, with that. And they're teaching doctrines as well. You see, it tells us that they were teachers in the church. They were people who had positions of, of, of responsibility, of authority, of leadership, but they should not have been because they were teaching wrong doctrine. So I often joke about going to Chinese restaurants and Taiwanese restaurants and eating the, the food there because they're sacrificed to idols. Now, 
It's up to us to weigh how offensive that is to Jesus. Do it in faith, pray, seek his face. But it is something that he is very much in opposition to. All right. So verse 17, he who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, to him I will give some of the hidden manna. It's amazing that he points to food, right? <laughs> Why does he point to food in his conclusion? Because the believers, the believers, some of the believers in this church are not eating foods that are put unto him. The manna, Jesus is a representation of manna. He's the bread that came down from heaven. In other words, he's saying, don't eat the food that's offered up to Satan, the emperor, because that's what's, what's being served in the inns, in the houses of ill repute. Don't eat that food. Eat my bread. If you overcome, you will eat my manna. And I will give him a white stone and a new name written on the stone, which no one knows but he who receives it. That's a wonderful promise. Isn't that just a great promise? What a wonderful promise. We have names that only he knows at this time and will be revealed to us when we see him. My, my, my objective in life is to eat of the manna that, that has been provided for me. He is the manna that has been provided for me. One of the things that I really despise about the COVID uh, restrictions and protocols is that we're unable to do, to this point, uh, to get back to doing communion. Communion is, is, is an important activity for the church. Not because it's tradition, you know, it's what we're supposed to do, but because of this. The symbolism that's tied into communion is very important. It's important for the life of a congregation. And not because we somehow eat a piece of bread and drink a little grape juice or wine and somehow that does something to us. It doesn't. It's a symbolism that you attach to it. And the faith that you put, that you invest into that symbolism, you're eating of the, of the reality of Christ, you're you're, you're, you're eating that manna that God has sent. You're living in Him. In other words, you're deriving life from Him. You drink that wine, you're saying that my sins are washed away by His blood. And I have life now because I'm eating of who He is. So we'll come back. No, we got five minutes. We got time to do another church. What do you think of the churches so far? We've read about three, about three churches, Pergamon, Smyrna, and Ephesus. How is Jesus relating to these churches? Isn't, isn't it a little bit different, a little bit shocking even, the way he's relating to these believers? What do you think? But he's relating actually to the minister, the ministers, the bishops, the messengers. He's relating to them. And it's no bones. He's just straight to the point. Perhaps if he was relating or interacting with a weaker vessel in the congregation, he would have been different in his approach. But here he's speaking to the one who has responsibility. He is the captain of the Lord's host. He's speaking to the, if he's, if he's the, the, next to the general, to the, to, the, to, the, to the one ultimately that's in charge, he is the captain of the Lord's host. Who is the bishop? Who is the messenger? The lieutenant, right? So he's speaking to the lieutenant that's under him and, and keeping this, this unit together, and he's very direct. We're going to see just, just how much more direct he is when, he, when we read on here with the seven churches. But you understand what, how Jesus is approaching these churches. There are things that are wrong. We've got to work on this, Lieutenant. You've been appointed here for that. You've got to repent. You've got to lead your people to repentance. You've got to be serious about this. But the one who overcomes... So at the end of every exhortation, there's this wonderful promise. So he doesn't just show up and rebuke and chastise and admonish. He gives a promise to the one who overcomes. You know, back to my vision that I had here, my Christophacy, he was very gentle with me at the time. It was in, it was in 1992. I was a new believer. I had just come into this church. I was just just experiencing everything for the first time. I think you may have been here at that time. We had come together to fast and pray about whether we should continue with, with our TV program, weekly TV programs. It was a Wednesday night and we came together and we were seeking Jesus' face about how we should go forward, right? I stood, I stood, I, I stood right there 
and Pastor Ken was here, and he said, tonight we're going to put all of our emphasis focus on Jesus, because we want him to answer our question. So we're going to turn to him only. And we sang, turn your eyes, you know, onto Jesus. Turn your eyes to Jesus. We started singing that, and I just closed my eyes and started singing, and then this thing happened. Boom, I had this Christophacy. And like I said, it rocked me, but he was gentle with me, extremely gentle. I venture to say if there's sin in the congregation, now that I'm in a different p position, <laughs> now that I'm in a different position, if there was something in the congregation that needed to be addressed, I venture to say that the encounter may not be so light. I, I venture to say that. Because now I'm the colonel. I'm the one in the position of authority. I have more to be responsible for. So here he's, he's, he's relating to these men like, like they're colonels. He's the captain, they're the colonels, and he's holding them accountable. You know, basically, what are you guys doing here? But say to the church, this is the point, say to the church, the one who overcomes, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will grant to eat of the tree of life that's in the Garden of Eden. Church of Smyrna, rebuke, chastisement, upgrading, appraisal. And then, to he, who, to he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches, to everyone in the churches. In other words, he who overcomes will not be heard of the second death. In other words, you're not going to touch the lake of fire. You will not be overcome by the, if you overcome. What does that tell us, folks? If you do not overcome, what's the inference? You're susceptible to the lake of fire. And the last promise here that we read, the church at Pergamon, he who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, to him I will give some of the hidden manna. That's wonderful. And I will give him a white stone and a new name written on the stone, which, which no one knows but he who receives it. Now, those are promises, right? Those are promises. All right, so let's take a break. We'll come back at quarter after nine, and we will begin to look at the church at Thyatira. Strap yourselves in. This is a tough one. You see there clearly that Jesus, the Jesus of the actual Bible, not the Jesus that we've created, but the Jesus of the actual Bible has a bit of a problem with eating foods that are offered to idols. Now, foods offered to idols that does not only exist in Chinese restaurants and Taiwanese restaurants, they exist in other restaurants as well. You go to some European uh, Nordic type restaurants like German restaurants and so on, you would find on the walls and on shelves little idols that are, that are prayed to in their business establishments. In Hindu restaurants, very prevalent in Hindu restaurants, if you like Indian food, uh, you, go, you go whether it's uh, Hindu Caribbean food, Indo Caribbean food, or Guyanese uh, Indian food, doesn't matter what it is. If they're Hindus, their food is literally offered up before their idols every morning. Every morning. I used to go to a, to a, to a Trinidadian Indian restaurant owned by Hindus, and I got there early in the morning one time, and she was burning her incense to her patron goddess. And the incense were then placed in front of the establishment to burn out. The food there that morning was offered up to a pagan god. That food was offered to idols. Jesus has a bit of a problem with that. Yes? So, so that's not the same thing as like when they put food out? No. 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 This, this, is, this is very literal. Very, very practice oriented. You know, in Acts chapter 15, when the church had their counsel about what's acceptable, what's not acceptable for the Gentiles that are coming in, the, the conclusion of the council was that they would refrain from foods 
offered to idols, Gentiles, that they didn't have to circumcise, they didn't have to do all those things that the legalistic Jews were forcing them to do, but that they would stay away from food offered to idols. Even in the church, the Book of Acts church, that it was not acceptable. And we see here the second time Jesus is rebuffing uh, that notion that you can eat foods that are offered up to idols. If Jesus has a, a very strong sentiment about it, then we should as well. We should. So I gave now, okay, let's read. Foods to commit acts of immorality, and that's, again, that has to do with the way that these pagan gods were worshipped, temple prostitution. Uh, it was a very, very prevalent thing. You know, for instance, a few years ago, a few years, about 25, 30 years, 40 years ago, they uncovered Pompeii. You know what Pompeii is? Yes. Mount Vesuvius, the, the volcano that erupted and, and covered Pompeii, the Roman tongue. And in excavating Pompeii, they found many of the houses of ill repute. And they discovered, which we've always known, they were inns and they were restaurants. And they were also places of worship. The prostitutes were objects of worship, you see. And so this is, this is happening in the church of Thyatira. And Jesus is concerned about it. And then he goes on to address the woman Jezebel. Now I tell you that this woman, this person, Jezebel, her name was not literally Jezebel. No first century Christian would allow themselves to be named Jezebel. I mean, let's be frank. She was a Jezebel. She was functioning as Jezebel, but her name was probably Gladys. <laughs> or something like that. Her name could have been Miriam or Mary. We don't know. But Jesus sees her here as Jezebel. He identifies her as Jezebel. All right? So Jezebel is real. And Jezebel is a strong governing spirit. So he calls this woman Jezebel. Now, what is she doing? He says, I gave her time to repent, and she does not want. That's always amazing. She refuses. She does not want to repent of her immorality. Now, how did Jesus interact with her about repentance? What do you think? How was that interaction made? Perhaps by the Holy Spirit. It is the Holy Spirit that comes to do what? Convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. So a few weeks ago when I had that conviction from God, it was heavy. It was pretty intense. I knew there was a sin that I needed to identify. It wasn't hard to identify the sin, and I repented. I, I wanted to repent. <laughs> uh, this woman did not want to repent. She refused. So that says that she refused the ministry of the Holy Spirit and did not want to repent of her deeds. Of, of her deeds. Verse 22, Behold, I will throw her on a bed of sickness, and those who commit acts, who, those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation unless they repent of her deeds. He wants her to repent of her deeds. She does not want to repent of her deeds. The man who have slept with her has to repent of her deeds. Now the next verse is pretty intense. Verse 23. And I will kill her children with pestilence, and all the churches will know that I am he who searches the minds and the hearts, and I will give to each one of you according to your deeds. So Jesus is serious about this. This is his church. There's a menorah that burns in this church that is supposed to reflect his light. He is the captain. And he's calling on the colonel to do something here because things are pretty bad. When I have to intervene, that's when you know things are really bad. You intervene so that I don't have to intervene. That's, that's what's happening here. It's chain of command. He's, again, he's basically saying, angel, messenger, pastor, do something here. If you don't do something here, I'm going to do something. And that's when all the churches will know who I am. And how serious I am about my churches. But I will say to you, the rest who are in Tyathira, who do not hold to this teaching, who have not known the deep things of Satan as they, as they call them, 
I place no other burden on you. Nevertheless, what you do have, hold fast until I come. He who overcomes and he who keeps my deeds until the end. Now, it's interesting that he says, he who keeps my deeds. Right? Because he just, he just basically threatened that if you don't repent of her deeds, I'm going to judge you based on her deeds. Keep my deeds. Right? What's his deeds? Well, the gospel is clear. And we probably don't need to go over it. If you love me, keep my commandments. The one who loves me is the one who keeps my commandments. A new commandment I give unto you that you love one another. Right? His deeds. Keep his deeds. Until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, as the vessel of the potter are broken into pieces, as I also have received authority from my father, he will give authority to them. And I will give them the morning star. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now that's a pretty powerful word, isn't it? Pretty powerful word. He's calling them to repentance. He's, he's pointing to the incredible sin that exists in this church here at Thyatira. This woman Jezebel has set the church into a tailspin. And he's threatening. Again, he's threatening. He's saying to the leadership and to the pastor, do something, because if you do not do something, I am going to intervene, and it's not going to be pretty. That's, isn't that what he said? Not those words. But that's what he said. To the church in Cyrus and in Sardis now, to the angel of the church in Sardis write, he who has seven spirits, excuse me, he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars says this, I know your deeds that you have a name, that you are, al that you are alive, but you are dead. What can we take from that verse? That this church has some problems. I know you have a name that, I'm going to paraphrase, that you believe is alive or leads to life. But what's really happening in you is death. You don't have life in you. Wake up and strengthen the things that remain which are about to die, for I have not found your deeds complete in the sight of my God. So remember what you have received and heard and keep it and repent, therefore, if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I come to you. But you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their garments, and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He doesn't like the actions of this pastor at all. He's not favoring this pastor's work at all. What do you think? He's not happy. Because he's already pointing away from him and saying there are some people in your church that have kept their garments white that I approve of. I don't approve of you at all. I don't, I, don't, I don't approve of this church at all. You think you have a name that you're alive, but you're actually dead. In sin. This church is in sin. We don't know the exact nature of the sin. It doesn't tell us. But what we're going to read here concerning the promise might give us a sense a sense only of what's going on. So he has some in the church who has walked with him and kept their garments clean, have refrained from the sin, whatever that sin is. He says, I will come like a thief, and you will not know the hour that I will come. What's the, what's the inference? The one that, that you, keep, you continue in this mode that you're in, you continue in this place that you're in, suddenly I will come upon you. What do you think it is that he's going to do? Well, to begin with, he's going to remove the anointing. He's going to remove the anointing. And perhaps he's saying, I'm going to give you over to sin, which is death. I'm going to give you over to sin. Perhaps that's what he's saying. He who, overcome, he who overcomes will thus be clothed in white garments, who has kept their clothes clean, right? You see that? He made reference to those who, has, who have kept their garments clean. The one who overcomes will be clothed in white garments, and I will not erase his name from the book of life, and I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. I submit to you that perhaps the sin 
has to do with the possibility that they will not confess in his name. They didn't repent. But they didn't repent of what sin? Based on what we just read here, I believe that they were ashamed of his name and did not confess his name. Because of what he said, I will confess his name before my father and before his angels, the one who overcomes. So I'm pretty sure the issue with this church is, or was, that you had some that did not confess the name of Jesus. What does that mean? They probably did, but they were perhaps unwilling to announce him as Lord and Savior. They were denying his name, in other words. Yes, Willie? So those who did not overcome, do you think that he is threatening them also to erase their name in the book of life? Because he said for those who will overcome, they will not be erased. So that's the next, the next, that's the next aspect. That's the, that's the, that's the, the follow-up aspect of the promise. Those who will overcome in this regard, who will confess his name and not deny him, will not have their names erased from the book of life. So the inference here is clear. You're not confessing my name. Your name's being erased from the book of life. Now, what's a good Baptist going to say about that? Not much. Right? Because in that setting, once saved, always saved. Your name can never be erased from the book of life. Absurd. Because once saved, always saved. You've heard that before. Now, that's not just Baptist. That's across the board with many evangelical movements. Once saved, always saved. You can't lose your salvation. How does that stack up against what the actual Jesus just said to this church? If you don't repent... And the implication is that you are denying my name. And listen, there are many ways by which you can deny his name. Many ways. I can list some. Ways by which you can deny the name of Jesus. If you do not stop denying my name, I'm going to take away your salvation. I'm going to erase your name from the book of life. That's a tough thing to, to digest. That's a difficult thing to digest. does not mesh well with much of evangelical doctrine. But if I didn't just read it from the Bible, I wouldn't consider it. Because I much prefer, listen folks, <laughs> I much prefer the evangelical position that you can do whatever you want and get away with it as a Christian, you're saved, period. You can do a little pornography, a little, who knows, a little, little carousing, a little alcohol, a little, a little thievery in your insurance business or whatever. You can do all those things, but you're saved. Once saved, after all, you're always saved. I like it. The natural man in me, partial to it, but that's not what the actual Bible teaches. And this is not the only place that I would consider that from. It's actually a pretty consistent doctrine that's, that's found in the Bible that, yes, we're going to be judged based on what we actually do, not our confessions, not our affiliations, you know, from the standpoint of many denominations, the guys in the other denomination, they're going to hell because they're not us. I mean, I mean let's be honest, right? Yeah. The, the Seventh-day Adventists feel that way about everyone else. Everyone else is going to hell as far as they're concerned. The Jehovah Witnesses, they have to go around and save everyone because everyone else is going to hell. And so you, you, you follow me, right? But yet, you touch the, the golden calf of the evangelical church, which is once saved, always saved, and you're a heretic. But the Bible teaches something entirely different. So, how do you, how do you deal with that? You don't deal with it. You simply accept it. <laughs> you simply accept it. Yes? Okay, so how do they deal with it? They don't listen. The book of Revelation and these types of verses that are found throughout the Gospels, they just bypass. Oh, but it's used when convenient. It will be applied when convenient. But generally, it's not part of their pale of doctrine because it does not fit in the pale of doctrine. And it's true. It does not fit into their pale 
of doctrine, it, it, it just don't, doesn't work. So they don't emphasize on it. Now I'm not talking about fundamental Bible-believing churches. I'm talking about many of the, the churches that are out there teaching that new type postmodern Christianity. They don't touch this. They don't want to see it. And perhaps that's why they tell you, don't bring your Bible. Bible, what's that? We're going to put the verse up on the wall for you, and that's all you need. I remember when uh, Mr. Hunter over at uh, Northland started mocking people who were bringing their Bibles. He referred to them as flippers. You know, you're teaching on a Sunday morning, Bible verse, flippers. And he mocked them. He mocked people that will bring their Bibles to church. The truth is, they don't really teach the Bible. They teach aspects, concepts from the Bible, but they're not really teaching the Bible. And that's a, that's, that's a, a, a stark thing to say, but it's true. I hate to tell you it's true. The actual, the actual message of the Bible, the true message of the Bible, is seldom ever really t taught today in those type churches. But you have untold numbers of churches that are Bible-believing churches, and they teach the Bible. Those are the churches you want to be a part of. And there are many of them. They're everywhere. They're not in the limelight. Many of them do teach the whole Bible. But the new, the new postmodern churches, they, don't, they barely cherry-pick anymore. It used to be that they would cherry-pick. Well, they barely do this anymore. They might have, <laughs> I hate to say it, on a Sunday morning, they might have half of a, a verse from the Bible, you know, and they will just put a, a light on that and just go with that and that only. And they would build all sorts of psychological, feel-good, therapeutic type messaging around that one half of a verse or something, and they'll run with that. And the people would say, fine, I love it. It didn't challenge me. It made me feel good. Actually, I feel like I can give my tithe here. I, didn't, I wasn't offended. The word of God wasn't applied, and that's, that's great. Sad, but that's where we are in much of modern Christianity. But there are churches out there that are fundamental and remain faithful to the word of God, and, and that's where you want to be. You don't want to be in a place where the message is diluted, it's watered down, and they're actually teaching you another gospel. You don't want to be in such a place. All right, so the church at Philadelphia, right? The angel to the church at Philadelphia. He who is holy, who is true, and has the key of David. Now, I'll be frank with you. I don't know what the key of David is. So we're not going to spend any time there. Who opens and no one will shut. Who shuts and no one will open says this. I know your deeds. Behold, I have put before you an open door which no one can shut, because you have a little power and have kept my word and have not denied my name. You see that right there, right? Have not denied my name. Behold, I will cause those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews and are not, but lie. I will make them come and bow down at your feet and make them know that I have loved you. That's wonderful wonderful verbiage. Because you have kept my word, excuse me, you have kept the word of my, of my perseverance and have also kept, and, and excuse me, and, and also will, keep, ah, I also will keep you in honor in the hour of testing, excuse me, that hour which is about to come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. So there's a testing coming. Clearly, that testing came shortly after this. Uh, there's a testing coming, and he, he, there's a word of my test, my perseverance. So I just saw this here for the first time, verse 10. Because you have kept the word of my perseverance. I'll be interested to see if the word, word there is logos or rhema. If it's Rema, it means that the, there was a message given to the church about perseverance that he gave perhaps through the pastor or the preacher. So perhaps there was a message here given to this church about perseverance. About perseverance. 
And now he's saying, if you, keep my, if you keep that message, that word of perseverance, I will also keep you from the hour of testing. So something is coming upon this church at Philadelphia. What does the word Philadelphia mean? A brotherly love, the place of, you know, we, we know that. It, it comes from the, the Greek word philio for love, love that we will have for each other. I am coming quickly, hold fast, hold fast what you have, so that no one will take your crown. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he will not go out from it anymore, and I will write on him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem which comes down out, came, which comes down out of heaven from my God, and my new name. That's quite an extended promise. What are the promises here? He will make them a pillar in, in this temple. They will not go in or out anymore. He will write their name in, in the pillars of that city, in this new Jerusalem, and they will have his new name. <laughs> These promises are multifaceted, wonderful promises. He who has an ear to hear, what the Spirit says to the churches. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now the final church now is the Laodicean church, the church at Laodicea. Yes? He who has ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Twelve? Apparently, that's what it is there. I've thought about that before. Uh, you know, he says to us that we'll have a white stone. We'll, those who overcome will have a white stone with a new name written on it, which no one will know but the one who receives it. Apparently, he has a name as well that no one knows. Whatever that name might be, whatever it represents. But he's saying the part of the promise here to the church at Philadelphia is that you will also have that new name that's given to him. So these, these promises are quite incredible, right? Now, the worst is left for last. Although that other church, what, what church was it that was pretty bad? The church at Sardis? Pretty bad. But Laodicea is a tough church as well. Things were tough at, at Thyatira, Jezebel, acts of immorality, adultery, Pretty bad stuff was happening over there. Now, the church at Laodicea, from a certain perspective, is by far the most corrosive, the worst of the bunch. And, and you, I'll share with you why I believe that the church at Laodicea is, in fact, the worst. To the angel of the church at Laodicea write, the Amen, the faithful and the true witness, the beginning of the creation of God, says this, I know your deeds, and you are neither cold or hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. Why? So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. So you understand the reference there, right? There's been enough messages framed around this, right? So you sip a uh, coffee. You know, this morning I was, I had a meeting. I had a meeting with the elders. I had a day old coffee there. It was actually decaf. Sitting on my desk, it was cold. I drank it. It wasn't too bad. Now, you either drink it cold like that or hot. When it's just somewhere in the middle, that's not pleasant at all. In fact, it's just unpleasant, right? One second. It's just unpleasant to drink lukewarm coffee. He's saying you need a on fire for me, or you just, you're not even out there denying me. You're just somewhere in the middle, and I really can't stand it. It's like what Elijah said, if God is God, serve him. If Baal is God, serve him. How long will you linger between two opinions? So how long will you be lukewarm, church at Leo? They say, you make up your mind, because I can't bear you being lukewarm. This is the Jesus that we know. This is his opinion. Don't be in the middle. Be on one side or the other. That's, that's, a, that's a different aspect of, of Yeshua, right? Because you say, I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing. Now, this is 
scholars believe this is referring to literal wealth. Laodicea was a pretty powerful, influential town in Asia Minor. Uh, the, the trade was their thing, uh, commerce, trade, and they were wealthy, wealthy uh, community. And, and scholars believe that it's referring to literal wealth. All right, uh, and you have and wealthy, need of nothing, and you do not know uh, that, but, and you do not know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I advise you to buy from me gold refined by fire that you may become rich, and white garments so that, you may be so that you may clothe yourself, and that the shame of your nakedness will not be revealed, and the eye salve of, to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Now, verse 18 is quite profound, right? It talks about fire, gold that's refined in fire. What's, what's the symbolism there? I think, from my perspective, this is a wealthy church that has compromised quite a bit. Unwilling to deal with rejection from the larger community, they've compromised and therefore they experience no persecution, no refinement. They've acquiesced to Rome and they're wealthy because of it. They have everything. And Jesus said, but you're poor and wretched. I recommend that you, you get for yourself gold, purchase for yourself gold that's tried by fire. And then you'll be rich. You see his symbolism. In other words, church at Laodicea, don't compromise. Face the, the inevitable persecution. Endure, persevere, be refined, and then you'll be rich. Because right now you're pretty wretched. You understand what he's saying, right? I'm adding a lot of passion to it because I want to I stress what, what we're seeing here. So this is a pretty wretched church from Yeshua's point of view. They have all the money in the world, but things are bad because clearly they've acquiesced to the, their surrounding environment. Yes? So it's like they're spiritually impoverished, right? They're just yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you think, about, think about a church today that's uh, wealthy. Right? They, have all that they, they have all that they can want in terms of, you know, retirement plans for their pastors, and they have 20, a fleet of 20 pastors, and they all make good money, you know, uh, and, and the worship leaders, his salaries in the upper five figures, and, and everything's good. The church has a good saving, and everything's good. But that church did a lot of compromising in the community among leaders. And for instance, uh, there's a certain church here that's no longer on the rise. It's sort of stagnant right now. But during its heydays, its best days, they had compromised with a certain imam, a Muslim cleric, very wealthy Muslim cleric, who basically said, if you promote certain aspects of Islam, like Sharia law, we're going we're to make sure that you can build your new building. And this church went into a project, a $20 million project, started off with $5 million in cash in this project, took a loan for the rest build a nice new building. The pastor began to compromise. He began to find himself at UCF, at Tallahassee, promoting Sharia, defending Sharia. Well, the church declined rapidly, and now they're, 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 they're owned by the bank for that extra 10, 15 million dollars. That church is Northland. So, rich, but wretched because of the compromise. You can't compromise before God. So, so rather than compromise, you, you, that pastor at the time could have said to that Muslim cleric, uh, no, I'm not going to go along with your little plan. In fact, I'm going to reject you right now. Now, he, he may have received a little persecution. He may have been refined. His, his goal would have begun to shine because of the refinement, the fire, but then he would have been rich. I'm just relating that to something local here that occurred in the last 20 years or so. This is the church at Laodicea. 
All right. Now, nakedness. They're clothed, but they're naked. He, he admonished them to, to acquire white garments. What's the, what's, the, what's the significance of the white garments? Priestly garments. Revelation chapter 19. The righteous acts of the saints are the fine white linen that they will receive. And that linen is the priestly garment. So he's admonishing them to walk in righteousness by faith. Trust him. Don't shy away from persecution through acquiescence. Don't be poor. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. Therefore, be zealous and repent. <laughs> now, verse 19 sort of says it all, doesn't it? Those that I love, again, I reprove and discipline. Therefore, be zealous. Be zealous for what? The truth, the kingdom of God. Be zealous for me. Be passionate about these things. And repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and will dine with him and he with me. He who overcomes, I will grant him to sit down with me on my throne as I overcame and sat down, on my father's, I sat down with my father at his throne. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Verse 21 gives a hint again as to the compromise that was occurring in the church at Laodicea. The one who overcomes will sit with me. In other words, the one who does not compromise will sit with me because I did not compromise and I sit at my father's throne. Jesus was adamant, zealous, wasn't he? Jesus was zealous. The zeal of your house has consumed me. That prophecy was applied to Jesus. The zeal, the zealousness for you, your kingdom, your house has consumed me. So Jesus is being consistent with the Bible. Don't compromise. Be zealous like I was. And as I sat with my father at his throne, you will sit with me at my throne. That's the promise. I want to sit with Yeshua. I'm not going to compromise to anyone. I'm not going to hold back the word of God. I'm going to let the word of God go. And I'm not going to compromise. See, weeks ago, three weeks ago, confronted with sin, confronted with unrighteousness, I could have compromised. For the sake of not offending anyone, don't want to upset someone, so I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to make the statements that I need to make. But then I would have been like Laodicea. I would have won friends, and I would have been wretched and poor and miserable. So I didn't compromise. And my hope is that throughout the rest of my life, I will never compromise. And I will sit with Yeshua at his right hand, at the right hand of God himself. That's the promise. That's the essence of the promise. Now, what about the church at Laodicea that was particularly odious? Well, it's subsequent history. It's history, what followed. Because it was the church at Laodicea in the year 339 AD that compromised with Torah and with the Shabbat and with biblical festivals. They had the Council of Laodicea and I believe it's 339, it could be 369, you'll have to check it out. So after the Council of Nicaea, the church committed itself to frequent councils that they, will, that they will keep in different parts of the new Christian world, this new Christian empire. They would have councils frequently, and they had many councils. And so at Laodicea is where the bishops, the leading bishops, no doubt the bishop of Laodicea, the messenger, the angel at Laodicea, led the effort to say, we're going to do away with Shabbat. In fact, at Laodicea, they said, we have the authority, my goodness, we have the authority to say the Shabbat is now on Sunday. We have the authority to say that biblical festivals are no longer necessary. In fact, if you keep biblical festivals, you are a Judaizer. That's where that was decided, Laodicea. And that paved the way 
for pagan festivals to be celebrated rather than biblical festivals. At Laodicea, it was, it was, it was outlawed to observe the Shabbat and biblical festivals, ultimately. And that was the impetus that they needed to destroy the churches in Judea, Samaria, and the Galilee that were Shabbat observant, that were, in fact, biblical, the Nazarene church of that century, the Notchrim in Hebrew. So you see what happened to the church at Laodicea. But Jesus admonished them to do what? To cease compromising. Don't compromise like this any longer. Be zealous. Zealous for what? Ah. Be zealous for what? The kingdom of God. We would say the law of God. God's Torah. God's word. Be zealous. He says. And repent. This same church ceased being zealous for the law of God. And in Saturday, embraced paganism, did away with the Lord, did away with all those things. So you see, what I'm saying is the church at Laodicea went on to destruction. Perhaps not too long after this, he stripped them of their menorah, perhaps, which led to them becoming a major church in this new Christian global empire. You see, because what Constantine established was a Christian hegemony. Hegemony, hegemon. That's what, that's what Constantine did. That's what they did in Nicaea. A Christian global empire. Pax Christiana is what they did. And Nicaea led to Laodicea. And Laodicea led to another council, another council. And by the time the 5th century comes around, they already had formed a completely unscriptural Christianity that still exists to today. I'm anti-Constantinian Christianity. I'm, I'm anti-Nicene uh, Christianity. I am, am anti-Laodicean Christianity because it's not biblical Christianity. It's not the Christianity that Jesus, Paul, and the apostles, the early church, endeavored to establish. It is far removed from it. It is not even recognizable from a biblical viewpoint. It is unrecognizable. And that Christianity still exists. I told you about uh, a, a, a reverend who attacked me on Facebook. He didn't do it face to face. He did it backwardly. Um, you know, he did it from the side. He didn't come directly at me. Just threw something up there. Uh, addressing, addressing my statement about Hanukkah. How as believers, Hanukkah is very relevant to who we are. We are the ones who will purify the temple. We are the ones who are called to bring light into the darkness of this temple that God has allowed us to be a part of. And we are temples ourselves. And many aspects of Hanukkah does associate with us as Christians. Well, he came out and he just denounced Hanukkah, and he made some very, very Constantinian statements. Very typical Constantinian Nicene statements that the Jewish practices are done away with. That Jesus came to alleviate them and introduce something new. Where did that come from? It came from Laodicea. It came from Nicaea. It came from the, from the slew of of councils that followed after Nicaea. So even to today, Constantinian Christianity is active and very aggressive, extremely aggressive. It's called Orthodox Christianity. It goes by that name. And what's really, really sad is that even in the evan some of the evangelical movements, the more fundamental movements, you find vestiges of, of Nicaea in them as well. It's tied in with the doctrine. Because what did they do at Nicaea? Nicaea was not a one weekend event. I think it lasted years. But the council itself was six months. Or so six months, you can look that up somewhat. The council itself lasted about six months. And years of preparation, years of after work. The council was to put in place new doctrine that's going to determine the destiny and the direction of Christianity, the Christianity that they form. So all of that, all of that doctrine, all of, all of those 
doctrinal positions is still alive very much in the Orthodox Church Greek Orthodox uh, Roman Orthodox Russian Orthodox you know Coptic that all of the doctrine is still very much there but it's horrifying that you find it in the modern evangelical churches how did that happen after the Reformation churches reformed and became more biblical but we still find we still find vestiges of the of, of, of Constantinianism in the churches how did that happen well we didn't reform completely we really only reformed in one way salvation by faith only it's actually justification by faith only that's what the Reformation was about Martin Luther had a problem with the Roman Catholic Church that was saying you're, 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 you're justified by works the things you do is what justifies you and Martin Luther he wrote that essay and he challenged the Orthodox Church and and then comes the Reformation movement you see the Reformation movement was very limited they only reformed with one issue but there's a there's a list of issues that needs to be reformed festivals Shabbat the, the importance of Israel the importance of Bible prophecy from a biblical perspective Torah all these things there's there's reformation needed so for that reason you don't have a church today that's fully reformed now me I am as reformed as I can possibly be because I've rejected everything that happened at Nicaea everything not much good happened at Nicaea and I lead this church in that same way that we are reformed we are rejecting everything that Nicaea has introduced we're returning to the Bible so a little us we're reformed to that extent there are other things that perhaps God will show us as we go along that we need to reform from and there are other people like us so the Reformation is complete in some the Reformation is not complete in the church in general and a lot of Constantine is still alive in the church in general still very active still very dominant I mean really why is it that you cannot go to Hobby Lobby on a, on a Sunday to shop why why can't you go to Chick-fil-A and get a sandwich on a Sunday morning because they're observing Constantinian Christianity I would love a good chicken uh, chicken biscuit on a Sunday morning I'm here preparing for a message that's that'd be a wonderful thing cup of coffee that's beautiful but I can't because of Constantine you see you have vast numbers of Christians evangelical Christians that are still tied in to Constantinian Christianity it's a sin it's a sin that should be repented of Jesus called the church at Laodicea to repent of your sin your compromise your acquiescence and get zealous he said zealous for what zealous for the Word of God zealous for the law that's the sin that's the sin now Jesus held this church accountable ultimately he pulled he jerked away the menorah from their midst and guess what this church was a part of that Council of Nicaea they went up to Nicaea together with hundreds of other churches at that time the Council of Nicaea existed uh, consisted I should say of bishops from most of the leading churches of that time in the world that's what the council was all the leading bishops came up and there was this huge compromise at Nicaea decisions were made that would chart the course of that Christianity to today and that's what happened and we're still on that path today Jesus stripped the churches that were outside of his will and purpose of the anointing now Paul said in 2nd Thessalonians chapter chapter 4 I believe it is he said concerning the apostasy that would come this is the apostasy no question about it he said concerning this apostasy the lawless one will change the times and the laws what are the times well the festivals the appointed times that's he would change the times and the laws so this lawless one that Paul saw coming will will interfere with Torah the laws he'd be the lawless one he's going to interfere with the festivals 
He's going to be the son of destruction. Why? Because he's going to destroy the church. And he said he's going to take his place in the nehos, the living temple. That's what Paul said. Not the physical temple, the nehos, the living temple, which is the church. But then he also said that Jesus will do what? Will destroy him with the two-edged sword that comes from his mouth when he comes. So, a lot of people say, well, this is clearly the Antichrist. He's going to sit in a physical temple. No, the word is nehos, spiritual temple. And Jesus is going to slay him when he comes. No, not the Antichrist. That's somewhere in the future. He's going to slay the essence of Constantine. The, the vestiges, the remnant of Constantine. In some cases, it's not a remnant. In some cases, it's an institution. You know, constant, uh, Orthodox Christianity comprises of almost 85% of all Christians in the world. That's 2.5 billion Christians. Almost 85% of them are Orthodox. They're Constantinian. Stop and ponder that for a moment. That church, now not the believers. Believers can get out of it. Believers, the, the people that are trapped in these churches can repent and come out. Just as Jesus called the church at Laodicea to repent, they can repent and come out of it. Would they? I hope they would. But Jesus is going to slay that church with a two-edged sword when he comes. He's going he's to get rid of Constantine after 16, 1,700 years of Constantinian activity. He's going to cast that thing into the lake of fire. It, that thing is going to be the false prophet, a church movement. So, church at Laodicea, by far, by far the most poisonous of them all, the most infectious of them all, because they went on to do things that none of the other churches did really bad things. Again, they interfered with it. They, 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 were, the, they were the vessel of the, the apostasy. They were the, the vessel of the apostasy. They, along with other churches, became the vessel, the, 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 the means by which the apostasy came into being, and the apostasy is still alive and very active today. Very active today. Would I love to see, you know, uh, um, Chick-fil-A open on a Sunday morning? Yeah. Not because of the chicken biscuits, but because I would know that they've given up the, the lies of Constantine. I would love for, for, for Chick-fil-A to be closed on a Saturday, making the statement that the Bible is real and God's law, we're going to be zealous for it. We've repented. I would love that. Is it going to happen? Probably not. I have a hope for repentance for this country. I do. I honestly have a hope for repentance. Would it happen? I don't know. I want it to happen. Right now, it does not look like it's going to happen. It looks like we're going to go headlong into the wrath, to know the wrath of Jesus. Not, not the Jesus who hangs under a manger tonight in many places, but the actual Jesus who will come and bring justice and righteousness seemingly not too far away from now and so revelation we just studied revelation chapter one to three and what's the conclusion the conclusion is god is merciful he's awesome but he has appointed yeshua with eyes of fire to bring about judgment and to bring correction to what has been certainly set off on a tangent of destruction he's here to redeem it Sometimes redemption would involve pain, pain. And, and no, no one wants to see pain. I don't want to see pain. I want to see redemption. I want everyone to be happy, but the truth is, there's going to be pain. And when you call to repentance, you repent. God, how many times did we read the word repent here in tonight's readings? A pretty serious Pretty serious moments. Repent, or I'm going to remove your candle stand. Repent, or I'm going to kill her children with death. She doesn't want to repent. Over and over. Repent, 
and be zealous for my deeds. Repent, repent, repent. God loves repentance. We're afraid of it. We are afraid of repentance. We're embarrassed by repentance. God loves repentance. I ministered to someone yesterday, someone close to me, and I said to him, there's a reason why you don't want to repent. You don't want to do it openly. The reason is pride. You're, you're proud about who you are, and for that reason you don't want to present yourself as flawed and actually repent. Now, God, on the other hand, receives that quite readily. Who gets glory when we're too proud, when we're too arrogant, we're too sure about ourselves to repent? Who gets that glory? Well, Satan. Absolutely. God loves repentance. He loves a broken and contrite heart. He will never despise or reject a broken and contrite heart. Even if you're a pastor. Even if you're a pastor. Repentance pleases God every, every time. So, next week we will get into the meat of Revelation now, Revelation chapter 4. I have a PowerPoint presentation to hand out and to, to put on the wall for you that will bring the entire book of Revelation into perspective. But remember this, that the book of Revelation can be compared, can be, excuse me, divided into three sections. Next week we will go further into the book of Revelation. Yes? No. We're going to meet, um, I think it would be the 